At this point, I'd like to introduce someone that I am a, a great fan of. That is Sharon Sales Belton, Vice President of Community Relations and Government Affairs at Thomson Reuters and former mayor of Minneapolis, who will introduce our keynote speaker. Sharon. Well, good evening, everyone. How are you? Let's give a round of applause to Books for Africa for 25 years. I mean, this is fantastic. I can't tell you how proud I am to uh, be here and be a part of this uh, program, but I want you to know that it wouldn't be possible uh, without uh, the support of uh, Thomson Reuters SVP, Tom Pfeiffer. So Tom Pfeiffer, a special thank you to you for getting me involved in this project. So it's my pleasure this evening to introduce uh, our keynote speaker. And I want you to know that I was just um, blown away when I read her, uh, her resume. This woman is phenomenal. Nazarazi Gumbavanda. OK, I practiced that really good. <laughs> Let me just tell you a little bit about her. She's a trained human rights lawyer with extensive experience in conflict resolution and mediation. And for over 25 years, she's been working on issues of women's and children's human rights. She's been active in women's movements, and more specifically, she's been focusing her time and attention on issues associated with violence against women, peace with justice, property rights, sexual and reproductive health rights, and HIV and AIDS. In 2007, Ms. Gumbavanda became the general secretary of the World YWCA, a global network of women and, of women and young women's leading, leading social economic uh, issues uh, in, for change in 25 countries. This appointment was followed by 10 years of experience with the United Nations, where she served as the regional director for the United Nations Development Fund for Women in East and the Horn of Africa, which covered 13 different countries. Prior to this appointment, let me just tell you, it gets better. <laughs> Prior to this appointment, she worked as a human rights officer with UNICEF in Liberia and in Zimbabwe, and also served as the interim coordinator for the Zimbabwe Women's Lawyers Association during its formative stages and in the Ministry of Justice for Constitutional Affairs in Zimbabwe. This woman is a pioneer and a trailblazer. Since joining the World YWCA, her core focus has been on three main areas, and these are important. One, championing young women's leadership through regional dialogues, internships, and strategic partners. Two, advancing peace with justice and addressing violence against women by positioning the YWCA as a leader in the community's response to crisis and conflict. So it's important to have a leader out there. And three, and this is really big, building on the role of the YWCA in promoting gender equality and women's empowerment around the world. Her notable achievements include work on the integration of gender equality issues and peace process in the Sudan, in Somalia, and in northern Uganda, and a very leading role in the International Conference on the Great Lakes region that resulted in the adoption of the protocol on sexual and gender-based violence, as well as property rights for returnees. This is important work, and I don't know if you know this, but this is really hard work. And she has been in the trenches working on behalf of our sisters, women around the world, and for that I am just so grateful. She continues to be active in addition to her work at the YWCA and a number of organizations, committees, and conferences all around the world. In addition to that, she's well educated. She has a master's degree in uh, private uh, law with specialization in constitutional property law from the University of South Africa and has completed postgraduate work on conflict resolution at Uppsala University in Sweden, which happens to be the sister city of the city of Minneapolis. And I visited there many times. <laughs> she's widely published and enjoys one of my favorite uh, bits of literature, poetry. 
She's married and has two children, and I don't know what, how much time she has to do all of this, but she gets a lot of work done. We are indebted to you. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our honored guests. In Africa, when it's a celebration, you start by really celebrating. A real celebration. This is the 25th anniversary. Books of Africa, oh yeah. Team Wedu, oh yeah. The board of directors, oh yeah. All the volunteers and staff, oh yeah. yeah! All of us in this room this evening, oh yeah! yeah. Mother Africa, oh yeah. yeah! For education, oh yeah. yeah! To the future of our world of knowledge, oh yeah. When you celebrate, you start by celebrating the moment of conception, that moment when an idea was born. Tim, can, can you just, can I just hold your hand? <laughs> if you were, yes, please. I don't know who was there with you at that moment when an idea was born. If it was in Africa, I would have brought some cola nuts. I would have brought some ground nuts. I would have brought some wild fruit, just something African. I'm coming through Switzerland, so just grab them. <laughs> I stand here as a daughter of the continent. More than 40 some years ago, she gave birth. It was hard. She became a widow. It was in the rural areas, the 11th child of a 14th pregnancy was born. My father died when I was in the third grade. I am a rural girl as they come. I went to the city when I was almost 17 years old. I had never been to the city. I had a yellow dress when I was growing up and I thought today I'll wear my yellow dress. <laughs> it was my singular best dress. It was my uniform. I could not even afford the school uniform. I wanted to know where the bus comes from. I wanted to I'd go to school, dedicated teachers with no materials. The teacher would read from the book, and we would listen deeply, imbibing every word that comes from the book. I wanted to hold a book. I wanted to own a book. I wanted to have my books. There was not even a library to borrow from because only that which was available was for the teacher's reference. Somebody someday brought a book and old newspapers. I was given the opportunity to borrow that book, the single book in my classroom, and I was in the sixth grade. I took my book home, I read on my way to home, I read when I went to fetch water, I read going to the river, I read when the bus came, I continued reading, I continued reading, the kerosene lamp went dry. We had to stop the fire and I continued reading. I was reading Ernest Hemingway, The Old Man in the Sea. I didn't sleep. Because I wanted to finish my book. 
Because the following day I needed to give it to somebody else and I didn't want to give the book without finishing it. But it was mine for only one day. The following day I went to school happy, but I was dozing in class, I was sleeping. <laughs> and the teacher said, what happened? I said, I read the whole night. <laughs> it was that moment when I knew where the bus comes from. It was at that moment when I said, and my mother said, poverty should not take away your dream to seek knowledge and to seek information. And it should never, never, never rob the dignity within you. Look for that book and read it. Borrow it. Ask for it. Buy it. It was many years later when I was at law school and I would sit in the library, not with sufficient books, but at least with some books. So it's great to see colleagues from Thomson Reuters here. As a lawyer, I could associate with your publishing. Today, I stand here as that village girl, that village girl, who was reading with the kerosene lamp, that village girl raised by a widow, that village girl raised in a context of war. Today, I lead the world YWCA movement in 125 countries because somebody made it possible through education, through possibility of giving materials to us to enable us to have the knowledge, to enable me to have the possibilities. And I want to say on this 25th anniversary, thank you. Thank you for what you do. Thank you. When Patrick, you were giving us the numbers and you were saying 29 million have been shipped, I'm like, hey, the lives that have been touched are more than 29 million because a single book goes from child to child. The impact is more than the, the texture of a single book. The impact of what you are doing is so foundational, so fundamental, so basic to the being, to the identity, to the unleashing of the potential within the millions, not only in the moment, but in generations. So when my mother then passed away a couple of years back, seven years ago, I started Rosaria Memorial Trust. Simply to say communities, women like my mother, are raising children like me against all odds, having friends like you holding their hands. So I started Rosaria Memorial Trust simply to, to say there can be more Nyaradzai girls from the village to the global level. If only we can invest. We can invest in education, we can unleash that potential, and today I'm very excited that Rosaria Memorial Trust is working with 10 schools in Murewa in Zimbabwe, providing access to education, also looking at children living with HIV to also have access to treatment. The YWCA movement, actually before I go to the YWCA movement, I've never said a speech next to the Mississippi River. This is my first time in Minnesota <laughs> and I'm just, I'm just thrilled, I'm just thrilled to be in this space. I just had to say it, you know, it's such a fantastic, um, the YWCA movement. It is that movement which for 160 years has said we must invest in safe spaces for access to knowledge and information for young people. We should provide education from early childhood development, child care, basic, to schools. We run schools like in Bangladesh, seven, eight schools, primary schools, secondary schools. We run vocational training institutions. 
And so this evening for me to be also sharing with you about our YWCA and to be sharing um, about this great moment of the 25th, of the, uh, 25th anniversary, I just want to give us back four key messages about Africa. Today, Africa is saying we need to reshape the narrative of the motherland. The narrative of Africa has to be the narrative which goes beyond poverty, exclusion, and marginalization to a narrative which affirms the knowledge within the womb of the continent. And for us to be able to unleash the knowledge, the power, the potential of Africa, we need education. Books for Africa is but a critical part of that new vision, that narrative of Africa. We want an Africa that is prosperous and an Africa that is at peace with itself. There cannot be a prosperous Africa that is at peace with itself unless and until we have access to quality education. Unless and until girls like myself, little boys, can go to a well-equipped library, can with confidence peruse with choice the documents they want to read, can with confidence make a choice about the careers which they want to do, can with confidence harness the potential of technology and at the same time have the pride of holding the book. Whilst I like reading on all these gadgets, I also like to hold my book. <laughs> There's nothing which trades as holding your own text. I know that we have in our presence uh, the ambassadors from Africa, the mamas, the different organizations, Four key aspects which I know Books for Africa is contributing, has been contributing, and I encourage you to contribute to the next 25 years, to the next 50 years, to the next 100 years. First is access. Access to books. The issue of access and moving a book from one point to the other is a critical chain of relationships. And I have seen that relationships tonight, just in the interactions, just listening about this container is now here, there are people sorting in this warehouse, there is uh, this trust. That I could see the issue of access. How do we create a conveyor relationship where that book holds a value beyond the single shelf where it is? So the issue of access, it's also for us in Africa about access in very hard to reach communities, not just in the urban centers, but those hard to reach communities, which at times, I always say, if we can find a Bible and a Quran in any corner of the world in Africa, why can't we find a book, a maths textbook, the essential to read book in that corner? Why should there be arguments around access when other things, when Coca-Cola can access every kiosk, why can't we access every school with books? That is the conversation that we need to have. We need quality. Quality. Quality of education is grounded on quality of materials. You cannot have quality education unless if you have also quality of the reference books. You have that which you need. So the issue of quality in education is so much associated with the mandate of Books for Africa. Relevance. The issue of relevance in education, the relevance of our materials, the relevance of our books, I would like to know more about Books for Africa and some of the challenges that you confront in addressing the issues of relevance. How do we deal with relevance in a way that we embrace the global citizenship identity, but also in a way that builds the local knowledge, the local capacity to publish, the possibility for us to grow the industry in the communities in Africa? How can Books for Africa in 10 years, 20 years time be part of associated with local publishing? I I love poetry, I love writing, and I'm saying, how do I publish in Africa? 
so that Books for Africa could also be about building on the knowledge within the continent and distributing that knowledge which is existing within the continent. Maybe that is the new frontier that Books for Africa has to look at. In addition to sharing resources from here globally, from the US, how do we also share the knowledge, the resource, the capabilities that is within the womb of Africa? The last, the last issue that I want to share is around where is Africa? Where is Africa? I, my, I thought that Africa was my village until I went to Harare. Then I thought Africa was the whole of Harare until I went to Kenya. Then I thought Africa was just East and Southern Africa until I went to Liberia. But when I went to Trinidad and Tobago and went to Barbados, when I went to the Americas, including these Americas, I said Africa is more than the geographical definition of Africa. My challenge to books for Africa is the mission has to be beyond the physical space defined as Africa. It has to look at education for people of African descent and people in Africa. We know that there are still issues of disparity in education, including in this country. When you look at the access, when you look at the quality, the opportunities, we know that there are so many issues around immigration and migrants in Europe. I live in Europe. And therefore, I challenge Books for Africa for the book to trace where is that African, wherever that African is beyond the borders of Africa. Because that is the contribution to the integration of racial justice, of equality, and of non-discrimination. Lastly. <laughs> we are celebrating this 25th anniversary. I love celebrations. When the world, when next week, next Monday, I will sit at the UN General Assembly. Our ambassadors who are here, Ambassador Mula Mula, Ambassador from um, Ethiopia, and uh, our senator who was here, and many other officials here, will be sitting at the United Nations for the UN General Assembly to define the next development agenda, to lay the path into the future of development. Where is education in that path? There cannot be development, there cannot be peace, there cannot be rights without education. The role of Books for Africa and all of us is to champion, to advocate for, to call for investment in education. Because I get angry, I can use that word any time. When our governments our governments in this world, my world, can spend billions of dollars on military expenditure. And yet, and yet, and yet, and yet, my school has no library. And yet, my teacher is not fully resourced. And yet, and yet, and yet, education is under-resourced. Our role together is to call for appropriate allocation of resources to what matters. It's education and not military expenditure. The moment we have less guns and more books, the world would be a better space for all of us. I have, I have two children. I know that when I look at my kids, I say, thank God they've had an opportunity. And when I go home to Zimbabwe and I meet my best friend, Axelia, she looks tired. Her kids are not in school. She was my best friend, she still is. It's unacceptable to have inequality and education is the bridge that can make us all celebrate the dignity within each one of us. In Books for Africa, I celebrate you. 
thank you for your generosity. Thank you for your giving. Thank you for your being. And may you continue to be a Santeni son. Thank you very much. <laughs>